Gabimaru is a former shinobi of Iwaga Kure village. Because of a grave sin, the village chief has ordered him to be executed. However, due to inexplicable reasons, each execution has been a failure. The first one is beheading, where the executioner's sword is split in half after repeatedly hitting Gabimaru's neck. The next execution is by burning alive, but all that burned were his clothes. Because of this, an investigator named Sagiri is sent from Edo to check on this. She asks Gabimaru about his history and the reason for his execution. The former shinobi nonchalantly tells her that he grew up in Iwagakure. He doesn't remember who his parents were, but he does remember not feeling anything about their passing away. He trained to be a shinobi and became a formidable force. He made a living out of terminating people. He also says he was set for execution because he tried to run away from the village. And nobody leaves Iwagakure without the chief's permission. When asked why he wants to leave, Gabimaru refuses to elaborate. But he says that he wants to end it all. The investigator then asks if she can see his powers because it's rumoured that he can use ninjutsu, to which Gabimaru refuses to as well. So the next day, the executioner prepares another method to end Gabimaru's life. It's by two bulls pulling his feet apart. Sagiri notices how he curls up his feet, causing the bulls to get pulled together and resulting in another failed execution. Sagiri starts to get an idea about Gabimaru, especially when she has a conversation with one of the servants. He says that the prisoner is also known as Gabimaru the Hollow because of his expressionless face when committing horrendous acts. He also reports that when Gabimaru was caught, he ended the 20 people trying to apprehend him. Sagiri finds that quite interesting. Why would someone who wanted to end his life fight off 20 people trying to catch him? Sagiri points this out to Gabimaru later that night when they have another interview session. He denies it and proceeds to answer why he tried to leave the village. He says he was married to the daughter of the village chief, a sheltered, naive girl who was innocent about his work. He says he doesn't want to get stuck with that kind of woman and this kind of life. That's why he tried to leave. However, later that night, he reflects on the investigator's words. Why won't he pass away when he wants to end it? So he resolves to do it right. But the next day, the execution by boiling oil also fails. This prompts Sagiri to claim that the preparations are done and she's ready to proceed. It turns out her full name is Yamada Asimon Sagiri from the Yamada clan, a clan of samurais who are well known as sword testers and executioners for the shogun. Their specialty is beheading by a single swing, Gabimaru instantly recognises that Sagiri is the real deal. His instincts to live kick in as he grabs a sword from one of the servants and fights Sagiri. Sagiri says she has seen the last moments of many prisoners and has learned how to read their true feelings. She strikes a nerve when she says Gabimaru is lying about wanting to end his life. Then we see the real reason behind his situation. Gabimaru has true feelings for his wife. He didn't realise this until he saw one night the horrified face of his wife as he showed off his earning through his work. Since then, he knew he had changed. His wife was gentle and kind and did her part in their marriage. She was originally beautiful, but her father ruined her face. Despite this, she remained pure, and this affected Gabimaru in a good way. He loved his wife and he will do anything to make her happy. He decided to ask the village chief, his wife's father, if they can leave the village to live normal lives. However, he was betrayed by the chief and was sentenced to an execution. Sagiri realises Gabimaru still cares for his wife, so she offers him a proposition. He will be given a full pardon and the shogun's protection if he will join an expedition. The mission is to find the elixir of life that can only be found in a place called Shinsenkyo. According to legends, it's an island of paradise brimming with vitality and blessings. Some have considered it heaven. The shogun has sent many expeditions toward the island, but they all failed. If ever someone or something manages to return, they all return as body parts with wild flowers sprouting everywhere. The Shogun realises that those with expendable lives are better suited for the expedition. That's why he sent the Yamada clan to look for criminals that can be sent to the island. Gabimaru understands this as a chance for him to have a new life, especially since Sagiri confirmed his wife is still alive and waiting for him. With newfound strength and reason to remain alive, he accepts the invitation. The executioner and the guards protest against this turn of events, but Gabimaru shuts them up by using his ninjutsu, ascetic blaze. Sagiri is impressed. She notices that he's become a bit more animated than before. After all, he now has a goal. 
that is, to find the elixir of life, give it to the shogun to obtain the pardon, and then return to his wife. A few days later, all the criminals from different parts of the country are gathered on a secluded beach. They are granted a private audience with the shogun himself, along with his retainers. They are going to receive formal instructions about the pardon offered to them. Many of the criminals are infamous in their own right. Some are serial murderers, some do it just for fun, and some do it because they have to. As the retainers announce the specifics of the mission, Sagiri looks at the criminals. She does not doubt her skills when it comes to putting them down, but ever since becoming an assayman or a samurai executioner, she has been plagued with doubts regarding her feelings about her chosen work. She remembers the first time she witnessed an execution and the reason why she chose to be an assayman. Her father, Yamada Asaymon Kichiji, was to execute a condemned storyteller. She was so amazed by her father's skill because the storyteller didn't even realise he was beheaded. Since then, Sagiri vowed to replicate her father's sword swing, but her path wasn't easy. First, her father Kichiji was actually the clan's leader. As the daughter, she was expected to marry the next head of the clan. In ancient Japan, they didn't see women as leaders, only the bearers of the next possible leader. This duty was what was expected of her. That's why everyone was against her choosing the path of being an assayman. Second, being a member of the Yamada clan was not a good reputation in the public's eye. Aside from being executioners, the clan also made their living by testing swords on corpses and making medicines out of them. Sagiri was bullied and called daughter of the neck chopper or daughter of the cannibal. Despite all these hardships, she persevered until she became an official assayman. In her first execution, she cleanly beheaded the criminal. This showed her skill in swordsmanship. However, she discovered that the job is plagued with the souls she took. She realized she feared taking away the life of criminals because deep inside, she's compassionate, even for those condemned by society. From the outside, her face looked calm as she swung her sword down to separate the head from the body. But deep inside, her fears crawled over her body, making her cold and unsure. Aizen, her senior and trainer, noticed this. He told her that the path of a salmon was not for someone like her. If it came down to the real meaning of this job, would she be able to take away someone's life? That question was something that Sagiri still hasn't found an answer to. Back to the present, Sagiri's thoughts get interrupted when a criminal asks the retainers to stop talking about the Shinsenkyo. It's a legend after all, so why would they believe the mission in the first place? The retainer understands this sentiment. So, to prove his point, he shows the criminals the lone survivor of the recent Shinsenkyo expedition, if you call it surviving. The man is clearly not alive, even though he smiles and twitches. Wild flowers are blooming from almost every orifice of his body. The retainer emphasises that this expedition won't be easy and that the criminals are looking at their possible ending. One of the condemned stands up and says this is all a joke. But before he can even make a step, Aizen cleanly cuts his head. The criminals are surprised. The retainer explains that whether they accept the mission or not, they are all still convicted and must face execution. It's just a matter of where they will be executed. He adds that an seaman will be assigned to them once they are on the mythical island. They will be beheaded if they show any suspicious behaviours. If their seaman passes away first, they will still be executed if they return to the mainland. The only clear way for them to survive this ordeal is to find the elixir of life, bring it to the shogun and receive the pardon. To add pressure to this deadly mission, the shogun announces that only a few criminals will be allowed to join the expedition. One of the criminals, a yellow-haired competitive fellow, is already strangling another criminal. None of the Asimans nor the retainers react to this, so clearly they have to eliminate other criminals just to get included in the expedition. In no time, the place becomes a scene from Battle Royal. Blood splatters the ground everywhere as criminals get rid of their competitors. Meanwhile, the Shogun enjoys this bloody scenery. This makes it questionable if he is deserving to have the elixir, if it exists in the first place. Gabimaru approaches the retainers and asks them to stop this pointless, bloody competition. Taking someone's life when there's no good reason is not okay. Is there another way to determine who's going to join the expedition without ripping each other's throats? In response, the retainer asks one criminal to get rid of Gabimaru. Well then, he says. Then he proceeds to rip off that criminal's throat. He goes on to eliminate all the remaining criminals. 
Sagiri looks at Gabimaru through her sword. She sees that he's also burdened with the souls of the people he terminated. Yet he's known to be the Hollow, an expressionless slaughterer. Then she realises something. Perhaps she should not suppress her fear of executing people. Rather, she must resolve to carry the burden of the souls she takes. She gets emotional after finally realising there's a way for her to do her job without sacrificing her core values. In the end, ten criminals are allowed in the expedition. They are Aza Chobei, Tamiya Gantetsusai, Twisted Kayun, Nurugai, Horubo, Gabimaru, Akaginu, Yuzuriha, Moro Makia, and Rokurota. After a few days of preparation, the expedition to Shinsenkyo finally commences. The main ship brings them to a distance close enough to be travelled by small boats. Then the ten pairs, consisting of one Asemon and one convict, travel to the shore. At first glance, the island of Shinsenkyo is a dreamy paradise, despite some foggy areas. Trees stand tall and bloom. On the ground surrounding their trunks are different shrubs with vibrant flowers scattered around. The diversity of the flora is evident, even growing as close to the beach as possible. Sajiri is in awe, mainly because she doesn't exactly expect the mythical island to be true. On the other hand, Gabimaru is wary of the surroundings, despite the overall beauty. Indeed, the island is a paradise, but there's something unreal about it. Despite the variety of plants, it looks unnatural that they can grow in one place. Adding to this creepy place is their ridiculous expedition. They are only given three days' worth of food. It's as if the shogun doesn't expect them to last long. Then they're given a sketch of a tangerine that's supposed to be the elixir of life. Gabimaru is smart enough to conclude that the shogun and his retainers have no idea about what they are doing. Basically, this expedition and all the others are spurred by a whimsical idiot of a shogun who has heard about a drink that brings immortality. However, Gabimaru believes that there may be something that can extend life. That's because he witnessed the chief of Iwagakure get mutilated in the past, and still lived as if nothing happened. The chief said he had drunk a medicine to make himself immortal, and he acquired the drink from a faraway place. Gabimaru is just not sure if that medicine came from this island. He breaks the rope that binds his hands. However, Sagiri insists on keeping his hands bound. Gabimaru points out that it's foolish to do so, but eventually he relents. Just as he's about to tie his hands, he gets attacked by Twisted Kayun. His Aesimon, Kisho, simply looks at them. Kisho chides Sagiri about her rigid views of the rules. That's the reason why she's still the lowest ranked among the Asamans. Kayun interrupts them and says he wants to crush Gabimaru the Hollow. So, Sagiri lets her convict fight, but with his hands tied. Kayun doesn't wait. He brings out his assortment of weapons and tests them on Gabimaru one by one. Twisted Kayun was once a warrior monk who fell in love with weapons. That's how he got the sentence for execution. Now that he's here on the island, he can use all his weapons to his heart's content. He thinks it's better to eliminate all his rivals before looking for the elixir. But he's underestimating Gabimaru. In no time, he's the one resting on top of his weapons, all bloody and lifeless. Kisho can't be bothered by his convict's fate. The instruction to them is, if their convict dies, they can come back on their own and bring the convict's head. Sagiri tells him to be careful on his way back. But Kisho reminds her that she has no time to worry about others when she should worry about herself. Indeed, as they are talking, the other participants of the expedition have already let loose their rage. Chobei gets choked by Harubo the murder Buddha, but Chobei easily overpowers him. Akaginu the cannibal courtesan tries to seduce Yamada Asemon Shion, but this ends up with her headless and bathing in her own blood. Tamiya Gantetsusai, the blade dragon, chooses to do his mission alone and doesn't care about Yamada Asemon Fuchi. Meanwhile, Yuzuriha the Kunoichi decides to work with Moro Makia, the apostate. Not a few minutes later, they both lie on the ground with Makia's forehead pierced with a kunai. Rokurota, the giant of Bizen, takes Aizen's head and munches it for his lunch. Kisho points out that on this island there are no rules, only priorities. And to deal with criminals, Sagiri must understand that they don't follow the norms of society. They only follow their personal intentions. In addition, the shogunate is already planning a follow-up expedition, mainly made up of the new shinobis from Iwagakura. And this is not only about the criminals, it's also about the Asimans. There's a rumour that this expedition will determine the next head of the clan. So, if Sagiri wants to have the position, then she better prove herself. 
After expressing those insights, Kisho leaves the two. Gabimaru takes this opportunity to strike at Sagiri. He agrees that the criminals have priorities on this island, and they don't care about others. For him, his priority is to get the elixir so he can see his wife again. Sagiri will only be a hindrance for him. However, it seems like he can't do the final blow despite having many chances. Sagiri is also skilled in fighting, but she feels like it's wrong to take his life just because he's a criminal. As they fight, they both realize they have to correct their priorities. For Gabimaru, he's reminded of his wife and the wise words she told him. True courage is being true to his emotions. Giving in to his feelings is not a weakness, but a strength that he can use as an inspiration to leave his shinobi life. He realizes he's not exactly hollow. It's just that he's brainwashed to think emotions are useless when terminating people. He's also a human being, capable of having feelings, and that's okay. As for Sagiri, she feels grateful for seeing Gabimaru's true feelings, therefore allowing her to acknowledge her own. This time, her priority is to accompany Gabimaru in retrieving the elixir and coming back to his wife. She wants to see how a former criminal can turn his life around. Now that the two of them have returned to their senses, they see the other creatures on the island. Bugs with human faces, centipedes with hands as mouths and giants with mismatched upper and lower body parts. Is this island a true paradise? Or is it hiding horrors that are yet to be discovered? Continuing on with our story, we soon follow the exploits of other convicts and Asemon on this island of hell. Our first one being the strong and confident swordmaster. Tamiya Gantetsusai is a proud warrior that always looks for opponents to fight. He seeks thrills in fighting, earning him the title Blade Dragon, but he also hates being looked down on. That's why when a daimyo invited him to his home and doubted his swordsmanship, he lashed out in anger. He cut the gate with the embossed dragon, proving that he could cut the mythical beast. This earned him the contempt of the daimyo's clan and the reason he was sent for execution. But as we know now, he was given a chance for a pardon when he was included in the expedition to the mythical island of Shinsenkyo. His mission is to explore the Paradise Island and look for the elixir of life. He is escorted by Yamada Asayemon Fuchi, a samurai executioner who will be ready to behead him for any suspicious behaviour. But Gantetsu Sai doesn't care. If getting the elixir will make him a legendary person in history books, then so be it. But it won't be easy. The fabled paradise is not what it seems to be. As he and Fushi walk further into the lush forest, they encounter the strangest creatures and statues they've ever seen in their lives. In fact, it's not only them that experience this. The other survivors of this expedition are also experiencing the same bewilderment. Our main protagonists, Gabimaru and Sagiri, are facing misshapen monster giants, creepy centipedes and bugs with human faces. The two of them agreed to a truce in order to survive in the wilderness just as these monsters appeared. Gabimaru remembers his lessons from when he was still training to be a shinobi. He uses his ninjutsu, ascetic blaze, to set fire to these monsters. One by one, he slashes them with murderous intent. Meanwhile, Sagiri looks at her convict, destroying these monsters like she's been hypnotized. She isn't always like this. She never lets her guard down. But she looks on, amazed at the otherworldly massacre happening in front of her. So much so that she doesn't notice the giant Buddha with long hands behind her. She dodges its blow in the nick of time, but she gets trapped with the centipedes. The giant is about to hit her again when Gabimaru comes and slashes its long hand. Normally, he would never save anyone, but he's been influenced by his wife's teachings, so he's still getting used to it. They're about to get hit by the half-fish giant when Yamada Asimon Genji comes and cuts it to pieces. Following him is another convict sent to the island, the Kunoichi Yuzuriha and another Asimon Genta. Gabimaru thanks them before asking the Kunoichi what she wants. Yuzuriha doesn't hesitate to use her tricks and immediately attempts to seduce Gabimaru and team up together. Unfortunately for her, Gabimaru twists her arm. He's suspicious of anyone except maybe for Sagiri. He's aware of the ways of Kunoichis and he's loyal to his wife. Although Yuzuri have failed, she maintains that her intentions of teaming up with them are still valid. After all, in a heavenly place like this that hides hellish creatures, it's only advantageous to team up with others. She can offer information while Gabimaru can do the muscle work. Sagiri asks why Yuzuriha has two Asimans. Genji explains that it's because his convict, Moro Makia, had passed away due to falling for the Kunoichi seductions. He decided that she was dangerous. Therefore, she must be guarded at all times. 
so he joined Genta, the original Asemon assigned to her. Gabimaru and Sagiri both think there's definitely a little more to it, implying he's also been slightly seduced. And speaking of Makia, Gabimaru asks Yuzuriha what happened to him. She coyly tells them that after forming a partnership with him, she immediately tested the island's dangers on him. That's how she found out that the giants and centipedes were relatively harmless compared to the bugs with human faces. Their wings have hallucinogenic effects, and their stingers can cause flowers to bloom where it stings. In addition, Genta relays to them that the monsters and stone statues display both Buddhist and Taoist designs. These are two very different religions, which is why it's strange to see them all mixed up. Yuzuriha emphasizes that they all have the same goal of finding the elixir. Their safest way to do it and navigate the island is by working together. Gabimaru eventually accepts this team up, although he twists her arm again. Sagiri is already losing her grip on what's happening around her because of the hallucinogens from the bug's wings earlier. She faints and falls to the ground. Meanwhile, on the other part of the island, Aza Chobei fights off the giant monsters while his Asemon Toma looks at him with awe. It turns out that both of them are brothers. They were the sons of a retainer to a daimyo. But because of the daimyo's insurgency against the shogunate, they were all punished and stripped of their titles. Their father was executed as ronin while their mother passed away from an illness. Because of this, the siblings were left to fend off for themselves. Then a group of bandits tried to bully them, but Chobei had enough. Instead of fighting, he charmed his way into the bandits group and became a core member. This was until Chobei was caught and lined up for execution. As the siblings fight the monsters, Toma admires the strength of his brother, not only the physical, but his ability to use change to his advantage. He wants to emulate his brother's strength in handling changes. That's why Toma infiltrated the Yamada clan and became an Asamon a month after. Then the conditions for the pardon were given, and Toma used this to help his brother escape prison and execution. He doesn't want to be a burden to his brother. Even as a monster grabs his long hair and Chobei leaves him to defend himself, he knows that people who can't abide by changes will always be the victims. He can fight for himself, but he has complete faith that his brother will always come back for him, no matter what. When Chobei tells him that they'll find the elixir and drink it for themselves, Toma gets cunning and excited about this plan. But he warns his brother that from here on, all they'll meet will be other survivors and more monsters. Back to Gabimaru's group, they found a tree nook where they can take a break to rest and pool their knowledge. Sagiri wakes up from her fainting episode. She finds Genji Dono looking after her. Her convict is outside preparing a meal for them. Genta is fixing their torn clothes and Yuzuriha is pretending to keep watch while lounging on a hammock. Gabimaru has made kikatsugan, a type of food for shinobis. While eating, they put together their discoveries. Gabimaru scouted the surroundings when preparing their meal. He says that most of the plants found on this island can also be found on the mainland. But the most interesting part is that the flowers blooming here can also be found on the corpses of people who were first sent here. They remember the flower corpse presented to them during their selection. With that as a basis, they can assume the reason no one has ever returned from this island is that they all have been turned into flower beds. That can explain why the flora of the island is vibrant, despite lacking proper care. Yuzuriha spits out the kikatsugan she's chewing. But Gabimaru assures her he never used any ingredients from those human flower beds. He also tried to look for the tangerine that's supposed to be the elixir of life. But he found no plant that can remotely resemble the illustration. Genta says they shouldn't fixate on the illustration, but rather on the stone statues themselves. Perhaps the combination of Buddhist and Taoist elements is a distraction. But the real question is, how did the statues end up on the island? There's no indication that they can form naturally, so they should be man-made. This gives an implication that there may be humans living here or once lived here on the island that made those statues. Sagiri adds the monsters are also an enigma. She remembers cutting one of them and not seeing any internal organs. It's like someone haphazardly put two species together and presented them as religious gods. Genta arrives at a half-conclusion. They are too unrealistic to be natural and too artificial to be mystical. Whatever the case, Gabimaru thinks the existence of these creatures can only indicate the existence of the elixir. Therefore, they should be able to find it on the island. After the conversation, Sagiri walks away to have a few minutes to herself. She can't believe they've been there for a day, and so much has already happened. Genji approaches her. Without hesitation, he tells her to go back to the mainland. 
he offers to take care of Gabimaru as his executioner. He reminds her that she's the daughter of the Yamada clan's head, therefore her first duty is to marry the next leader. Being a samurai shouldn't even be her job, as women are not fit for it. He looks at Sagiri with eyes that clearly underestimate her. He tells her she has no skills to remain alive on this island that's full of mysteries. It would be better for her to go back and help the clan prosper by marrying and giving birth. Genta comes to them and expresses his opinion. He wants Sagiri to stay. But because Genji is a higher ranking Asemon, he has the privilege to give orders to his juniors. He gives Sagiri an ultimatum. He tells her he'll escort her to the shore the next morning so she can go back to the mainland. When Genji leaves, Genta says it would be difficult to sail back. Indeed, as they are speaking now, another pair of Asaimon convicts are struggling to row against the heavy mist of the sea. Asaimon Tenza is rowing the boat while his convict Nurugai is nonchalant about it. Then they see the shadow of a large ship. Their hopes rise only for them to dissolve in the mist when they find that it's the shadow of a ship's ruins. Apparently, many have tried to escape the island, only to get trapped in these dangerous currents. Not only that, but an unknown sea monster with many tentacles tries to attack them. They have no choice but to jump onto the larger ship. There, they find the flowering corpse of Kisho, the Asimon who tried to leave earlier. Then one of the tentacles cuts the body in half right in front of them. Nurugai sees all these and remembers where it all started. Nurugai was a member of the Sanka tribe, or Mountain Dwellers. The Shogunate decreed that the Mountain Dwellers were traitors and must be executed. Nurugai accidentally led a group of executioners into the tribe's location, leading to its massacre. Nurugai was the only one left and lined up for execution. But Tenza found the kid and saw potential. So he offered Nurugai a chance to be part of this expedition, even if it's only a slim chance of survival. Tenza shouts at Nurugai to help him fend off the monstrous tentacles. He can't let the kid's life end here because he knows Nurugai has a bright future ahead. Thankfully, the kid seems to wake up from their depression. Nurugai helps Tenza fight the tentacles. Then, together, they ride an empty boat and row back to the island's shore. While they are cleaning their wounds, Tenza is shocked to realise that Nurugai is actually a girl. She playfully teases Tenza, saying she'll marry him and start a new generation of Sanka with him. But first, they need to get out of that island. As night falls, Gabimaru offers to be on the lookout for the first part of the night. Sagiri joins him. Her head is still full of what Genji told her earlier. To her surprise, Gabimaru thanks her for setting his direction straight. Because of her compassion, he is able to steal his resolve to finish this mission. He wants to go back to his wife, so he'll face head-on those who try to stand in his way. Sagiri gets affected by this, mainly because this is what she also wants to do for herself. She praises him for being strong, and he returns the compliment. He says that sometimes, people can't know they are strong unless they've experienced a lot of things. Sagiri gives this conversation so much thought. The next day, she faces Genji. She is resolute in saying she'll stay on the island and finish the mission. She is a samurai, therefore he must see her as his equal. Genji's pride gets hit by this boldness from a junior. He swings his sword at her, but she manages to seize it. Genji gets the sword back and is about to hit her again when Rokorota appears behind him. Without a second to react, the giant convict swipes apart almost half of Genji's body. Rokorota, the giant of Bizen, is one of the convicts sent on an expedition to the mythical island of Shinsenkyo. Since his infancy, he has shown a profound appetite for food. His parents, who were humble farmers, doted on him. But soon his appetite transcended the normal food that humans eat he would come to learn that human flesh was a good substitute for animal meat. The villagers ran away from him, fearing for their lives, and soon even his parents couldn't escape his feral clutches. Rokorota grew up in this way, looking for playmates that can also become his food. That's how he ended up in the execution line and eventually got sent to Shinsenkyo. Rokorota finds Genji talking to Sagiri. Without hesitation, he swipes at the Asiman, nearly taking out his midsection. The force of the swipe sends Genji flying through the trees. Sagiri runs after her senior and attempts to stop the chunk from bleeding. She is so distracted that she doesn't notice Rokorota coming for her. Thankfully, Gabimaru comes in time and kicks the giant away. Sagiri gets up to stand by her ward. Looking at the giant, she realises that his Asimon Izen has already passed away. 
On the other hand, Gabimaru recalls the lessons he learned when he was still training to become a shinobi. One of the lessons was to analyse the enemy's strengths and weaknesses, and then come up with a plan using that information. But then Rokurota uproots a tree and throws it at him. Sagiri runs to Genji, whose life is almost waning. Gabimaru knows that Yuzuriha is around, so he asks her if she can help, but the Kunoichi refuses to help. She says their partnership only involves her gathering information, so instead she cheers him up. In truth, Yuzuriha doesn't care what happens to them. Her Asimon is hanging on a tree nearby, preventing him from helping the others. For her, it will be advantageous if Rokurota and Gabimaru finish each other off. In addition, no monsters have come up to them despite the noise. She might as well observe the process. Gabimaru tries different ninjutsu to assess what works against the giant, but so far nothing is effective. If there's one thing he understands, he must evade the far swipes of the giant's hand. Meanwhile, Sagiri attempts to preserve Genji's life, but they both know it's too late for him. In his last moments, Genji realises that Sagiri is not the usual samurai. She wants to hone her skills as a samurai and at the same time retain her compassion for others. Perhaps he should not have tried to convince her to return just because she's a woman meant to marry the next head of the Yamada clan. As his last show of respect, he hands her his sword and orders her to put an end to Rokurota. Sagiri rushes back to help Gabimaru fight the giant and with a swift blow manages to cut Rokurota's little finger off. Sagiri knows that certain body parts can be easily injured if one knows where to cut them. However, when she swings her blade on the back of the giant's knee, she finds it too hard for her blade to penetrate. She soon realises that the only way to defeat Rokurota is to behead him. Before they can do anything, the giant suddenly cries like a child in a tantrum. Then, to their surprise, his attacks have become faster and more brutal. What's worse is that Gabimaru's leg is finally showing the stress from the kick earlier. Because of this, he doesn't evade Rokurota's swipe in time. He gets up and prevents himself from giving in to his injuries, but his body can't take it anymore. Rokurota goes for the final blow, but Sagiri blocks his hand with her sword. She finally manages to control her emotions and fear of hurting other people. When the situation needs it, she must calm her inner world and think rationally. She wants to embody the technique her father used when peacefully beheading convicts. Therefore, she must be able to still the storm inside her. Gabimaru and the others are in awe of her swordsmanship. Senta comments that Sagiri is ranked last among the Asamans just because she's a woman, but when it comes to handling her blade, she can be on par with the top ranks. Genji looks at her and is proud that he gets to witness her skills develop on the battlefield before he passes away. Eventually, Rokurota tumbles onto the ground. This gives time for Gabimaru and Sagiri to form a plan on how they can make the giant bend down. Gabimaru uses his ascetic blaze to shoot fire everywhere. Yuzuriha and Senta escape as they realise that Gabimaru had purposefully set the forest on fire. With this, Rokurota suffocates, forcing him to bend down. For good measure, Gabimaru pins the giant's hand and orders Sagiri to give the final blow. In his last moments, Rokurota sees Sagiri's calm face as she cuts his head away from his body. As a final act of compassion, she holds Rokurota's severed head, much like how she would have held a baby's head. Then, as his life fades away, she closes his eyes. Soon, monsters from all over the island walk toward the fire, prompting Sagiri and Gabimaru to run away from the blaze. They don't understand why this is so, but they decide to run away from the fire as far as possible. Eventually, they find Yuzuriha and Senta standing beside a clearing. To their utter surprise, they find the remnants of an old village right in front of them. Does that mean that people used to live in this place? Are there still people living here? That's one thing they need to find out. On the other side of the island, siblings Chobei and Toma just finished fighting off some monsters. That's when Chobei senses that they are not alone in these woods. They hack at shrubs and trees to make their way toward this presence. Of all things to discover, they see two ladies with bright-coloured hair, both naked to the waist and making out in broad daylight. The scene would have been sensual, if not for the fact that the ladies suddenly turn to them with a creepy look. The siblings are too shocked to say anything. The pink-haired woman is amused by their presence and even invites the siblings to join them. The yellow-haired woman chides her companion. She's more annoyed that someone interrupted their session. Then, without warning, she turns into a man and confronts them. 
Instantly, the siblings know that this being is not a normal human. They fight the man, but he keeps regenerating. Chobe manages to cut him diagonally, but the man simply grows back his body parts as if nothing happened. The fight ends with the man dragging Toma's unconscious body, to which he throws him into a pit full of blooming flowers. Back to Gabimaru and others. They're still looking at the village. It's covered in a thick mist, and it seems like no life form is present in this place. Just then, Gabimaru senses another presence among them. He runs after it, prompting Sagiri and the others to run after him, but not before Groot makes a cameo and takes a swing at them. Or rather, a tree-like humanoid that's preventing them from running after whatever it is that Gabimaru is chasing. Sagiri tells Yuzuriha and Senta to take care of the tree while she follows her ward. Gabimaru catches up with the creature and is surprised to find out that she's a child. Sagiri shouts that they only want to talk to her. The child stops, but only to punch Sagiri. However, Gabimaru takes the blow. He notes that it was an incredibly powerful punch, not brute force, but more like a concentrated form of energy that's released from the girl's little fist. Gabimaru notes that he can't afford to be defeated by this, remembering that he still has a wife to return to. Gabimaru then gathers vines from around him and traps the girl with them. This time she cries, prompting Sagiri to comfort the child, who immediately stops crying. They return to Yuzuriha and Senta, who have subdued the tree-like creature. To their surprise, the creature speaks to them. He asks them to return the child to him in exchange for food and information about the elixir. Yuzuriha refuses both offers, but when the tree offers a bath, she immediately accepts. Well, after all that they've experienced on the island so far, they might as well take this unexpected hospitality from Groot's distant relative. He takes them to the heart of the village. Indeed, no other human beings are present except for them. They enter his house, which is full of vases and religious decor. Yuzuriha and Sagiri choose to take a bath first. It is such a relaxing experience that even Sagiri can't help but give in. After this, they gather again inside the tree's house. Fruits have been prepared for their meal. There, the island's visitors finally get to know a part of the island's history. The tree introduces itself and the child as Hoko and Mei, respectively. The island used to be called Kotoku by the inhabitants, and it was indeed the Shinsenkyo where the gods lived. He states that the island has existed for over a thousand years. Apparently, Hoko used to have a religion that he followed, but he has no idea about anything outside of the island, and the way he relates the story makes it look like he's telling a religious fact. He also confirms that the elixir of life is true and it exists in this place. He calls it Tan. Then he shows them the general geography of the island. The place has three regions. The shore and the woods are called Ishu. The village where they are is in Hojo, and the elixir can be found at Horai. It's within the mist at the center of the island. Gabimaru and the others feel relieved at this point of their expedition. This is better progress than the illustration provided to them at the start, but they still need to make sure that they are not being fooled by this tree. Hoko acknowledges their doubts. He's confident that once they meet the Tensin, they will never doubt his story. The Tensin are considered the gods on this island, and they live at Horai where the elixir is. They are beautiful beings, never aging, and far more advanced than normal humans. The creature tells them about this because he knows that they'll never escape the island. All humans that have tried to venture there have all been turned into flowers. These flowers then become the source of the elixir. Hoko considers getting turned into a flower bed a blessing because it erases the mortal sins of humans. This explains why all the corpses seem to be smiling. Hoko refuses to tell them about his relationship with the child, but he tells them that they both have been born and raised here. All they want is to live their lives quietly. After this fruitful discussion, Gabimaru decides to take a bath. He needs to tend to all the wounds he received upon arriving on the island. Of course, Sagiri follows him in the name of duty. Inside the bath, they see Mei preparing to take a bath as well. She cries again at the sight of Gabimaru. So Sagiri takes care of the girl, while the shinobi takes care of his wounds. Sagiri sees that the child has a large scar running across her shoulder but she makes sure that the child will be comfortable enough with her. She bathes her and uses some oils and treatments for the child's hair and skin. Meanwhile, Gabimaru recalls what his wife told him once. It's okay to take a break during strenuous times. If he doesn't, then he'll collapse even before the start of the battle. But even in relaxation, he must never let go of his true goals. Another thing he remembers is how he told his wife to not hide her scar. 
So, after the bath, he tells May to never be embarrassed about this imperfection on her body. It doesn't make her less pretty, just like the woman he knows. May appreciates this gesture, while Sagiri is baffled to know that Gabimaru is capable of saying such respectable things. They return to Hoko's house. This is simply a reprieve for them before they continue their mission to retrieve the elixir. Tomorrow will be another day to face their struggles. Gabimaru reminds himself again of his purpose. He must get the elixir to get back to his wife. We continue our story following the young and talented swordsman Tenza as he and his prisoner Nuragai find their way through this island of hell. Tenza was born in the slums. At an early age, he understood that his parents neither had the resources nor the desire to take care of him, so he took matters into his own hands. He wandered the streets, robbing people and taking anything he wanted. Except for taking people's lives, he'd done anything to survive. Because of this, people would think of him as trash, a good-for-nothing boy. He didn't mind these comments because it did not matter to him. But one day, after he beat a group of men for looking down on him, he met the person that would change his life. Yamada Asemon Shion took him in and taught him how to use the sword. This fateful event has led to Tenza in his current situation. He's on the island of Shinsenkyo, a mythical place where the elixir of life is supposed to be located. He is supposed to chaperone Nuragai, a criminal, to find it. Many of them have been sent to the island. But after their encounters, Tenza knows that many of them have perished. Therefore, he vows to protect the little girl he's been charged with. After their adventure in the sea, where they encountered a monster with numerous tentacles, they decide to go around the island to see if there's an available sea current that's safe enough for passage. As they walk, a human being suddenly lands beside them. A woman with orange hair looks at them, saying that many of their soshins have been destroyed. She is referring to the giant monsters that inhabit the island. Then, to Tenza and Nurugai's surprise, the woman suddenly turns into a man. The pair tries to run away, but the man easily catches up with them. He forcefully pushes Tenza, even though his hand has not made any contact with him. In retaliation, Tenza gets up and quickly slashes the man, then he beheads him. Tenza and Nuragai run away as far as possible, but the man catches up with them again. He runs weirdly, with his cut head and limbs only connected to his body with vines. Out of nowhere, a sword flies by, completely beheading him again. To the pair's relief, Shion appears and saves them from this dangerous human. After distancing themselves, Tenza introduces Shion and Nurugai to each other. Shion is his master and he looks up to him like an older brother. Shion scolds Tenza about his fighting stance, as if they're in a classroom. Then, he tells them that after he executed the criminal Akaginu, he also tried to find a way out of the island, but he was unsuccessful. Tenza says this will be a great opportunity for the three of them to work together to escape. Shion senses that his student is protecting the girl, so he confronts Tenza about it. Shion reminds him that the Yamada clan, where they both belong, follows and lives by the rules. Tenza is risking the clan by protecting a criminal, therefore breaking the rules. Tenza defends his decision, saying that he can see Nurigai's potential in a world where she can live freely. After all, that's what Shion did to him when the former took him in and trained him to be an Asimun. He gave Tenza a chance to see his full potential. So that's what he wants to do for Nurugai. Shun considers his student's point of view. After a few minutes, he sheathes his sword and smiles at the girl. Nurugai feels shy around this master. Shion is blind, but he can run through the forest easily, and he knows from that start that she's a girl. Tenza is happy to have made this agreement, but his happiness won't last long. The mysterious man is back, except that now he's changed back into a woman. Shion carries Nurugai as he jumps away, followed by Tenza. However, the woman has managed to cut Shion's throat. Tenza attacks the woman using the same fast sword strikes he used earlier, but the woman avoids all of his attacks, saying she's used to them. Shion wants to warn his student, but it's too late. Tenza uses an all-out attack. The woman dodges it. And when she gets close, she flicks her fingers, making four holes in Tenza's body. Everyone who sees it knows it's almost the end for him. If it's any consolation, the woman thinks Tenza is tougher than the previous humans who've arrived here on the island. Tenza sees flashes of his past as his life slips away. He remembers the time when he was still stubborn against Shion's teachings. He didn't understand why someone would spend their time on someone like him. Shion explained that everyone was like a bud of cherry blossoms. 
each bud has the potential to bloom given enough time. But young Tenza didn't like this kind of talk. He wanted to get out of the clan, so Shion gave him a challenge. If Tenza can land a hit on him, then he can go. Tenza tried it, but Shion was masterful in dodging his attacks. In the end, he decided to leave without saying goodbye. That's when Aizen found him. The Asoman asked Tenza to come with him before he escapes. They went to a cemetery and stopped by a grave. The grave belonged to Teshin, Shion's former student. Just like Tenza, Teshin was full of potential as a swordsman, but he never recognized it. He also left the clan, but he became a criminal. Eventually, he was set to be executed, and the one who would behead him was Shion. Teshin's last words were an apology to his master. Since then, Shion vowed to make sure that if he would take another student under his teachings, he'd make sure that student would bloom like a cherry blossom. Tenza finally understood the feelings of his master. So he came back and continued to challenge Shion. He wouldn't give up until he landed a hit on him. Back to the present, Tenza knows he's nearing his end. So he uses his remaining energy to punch the dangerous woman. But even though her brains have been bashed out, the woman manages to put another hole in Tenza's body. Shion tries to help his student. When he looks into Tenza's eyes, he knows that helping him will be a wrong move. Instead, Shion goes back to Nuragai, carries her, and runs away as fast as possible. As Tenza looks at them, his last thoughts are about the possibilities in his life. He could have been a master, just like Shion. He could have married Nuragai when the time is right. However, there's no chance for him to see all of it as he takes his last breath. By the end of the episode, we see that Tenza managed to land a hit on Shion in the memory. But instead of running away, he pleaded with his master to continue training him. Perhaps Tenza has already reached his full potential, and now it's passed on to Nurugai. In the village of Hojo, Gabimaru and the others settle in for the night. Everything is still a puzzle to them, despite the information Hoko gave them earlier. Gabimaru and Senta volunteer to take watch for the night, but Senta is too exhausted after trying to gather more information. Knowing that his companions will be safe here, Gabimaru decides to go to Horai, the center of the island. The mist gets thicker as he walks on, but eventually he sees some crouching figures a few feet away. They're the same humanoid trees as Hoko, but they don't seem as lively as him. Gabimaru knows that they're alive. Unbeknownst to him, Mei has been following him and keeping her distance. Gabimaru continues to walk until he reaches an enormous man-made gate. He is certain that this island is no home to any gods, but rather creatures that think they are. As if on cue, he feels a strong presence behind him. Gabimaru is surprised to see another human being. This is the same one who fought Tenza earlier. The woman tells Gabimaru to go away because she's not in the mood to capture humans after her encounter with a particularly tough one. Gabimaru then asks her if they really turn humans into the elixir of life. A few moments of tense silence pass before they engage in a brutal fight. The woman is stunned that this white-haired man is much stronger than the one she fought earlier. Gabimaru uses his ninjutsu, ascetic blaze, to burn her to a crisp. He thinks that's enough, but the burnt corpse attacks him. To his surprise, Gabimaru sees the corpse regenerating and turning into a man. Another round of a vicious fight follows. Gabimaru thinks of other ways to defeat this entity. He realizes he's fighting a Tenson, one of the gods according to Hoko's story. Cutting, punching, kicking, and even burning doesn't work. But when he manages to kick the man in the gut, he knows he's done serious damage. Before he can think further about this, the man turns back into a woman. Then she weaves her hands to collect concentrated masses of energy at each fist. This is similar to what Mei did when she accidentally punched Sagiri. Then the woman's eyes become dark before sending a ball of energy right into Gabimaru's stomach. What follows is an intense and brutal fight between the ninja and the Tensen. The Tensen's technique is definitely stronger, but Gabimaru parries them. After a few moments of barbaric exchange of fists, he defeats the woman, or so he thinks. Flowers suddenly bloom from her body until she gets fully covered. Then she transforms into a monstrous beast with four legs and a giant flower for a head. Instead of a flower style in the middle, it's composed of the woman's male and female alter egos. Without ado, the monster electrocutes Gabimaru. It follows the attack with slashes from its limbs before electrocuting him again. Gabimaru is about to use ascetic blaze, but his body has reached its limit. For a little while, he loses consciousness and dreams of his wife. He's grateful that he gets to talk to her even in a dream. 
he recognizes that he might not come back home after all. So he remembers his training as a shinobi. If facing the verge of death, he must be able to put as much damage to the enemy before dying. Gabimaru wakes up to the present and sees that he's captured by the monster's flowery limbs. He cuts one of them before setting them on fire. The monster lets him go. It's about to electrocute him again when Mei finally appears. She covers herself and Gabimaru in a protective ball of energy. Then they both fall to the cliff as lightning strikes them. When the morning comes, Sagiri is disappointed to know that her ward is not there. Hoko thinks he must have explored the woods through the mist and that Mei may have followed Gabimaru. So he, Sagiri, Yuzuriha and Senta set out to look for their companions. Hoko tells them more about the Tensen. According to him, the Tensen are seven hermits that have become gods and reside in Horai. He talks about them with reverence because he believes he'll be allowed in Horai if he continues to worship them. He also reveals that he used to be a human. In fact, the whole village was once a prosperous place with humans residing there. But then they started to transform into trees. And just as Hoko tells them this story, they arrive at the place where many humanoid trees are hunching and bowing as if in prayer. He says his daughter was the first one to transform. That explains why he has a soft spot for Mei. Hoko tells them that this is their final resting place, hoping to be welcomed inside the heaven in Horai. Meanwhile, the seven Tenzen are gathered inside their paradise. They talk about the advantages of being male or female based on their preference. Their leader, an intimidating man with purple hair, arrives and asks them for reports about the humans that have recently arrived on the island. He warns them to be careful, as this group of humans seems to be far different. As an example, he points at Ju Jin, the Tenson who fought with Tenza and Gabimaru. She has greatly aged due to too much use of Tao. Ju Fei, the yellow-haired man who took care of Chobe and Toma, is disappointed that a mere human has forced Ju Jin to use her Kishikai form. Whatever they are talking about will be explained in further episodes. But for now, we see them sharing and drinking a colourful liquid. When Ju Jin drinks it, she instantly returns to her youthful look. Is this the elixir of life that Gabimaru needs to obtain? Speaking of Gabimaru, he's still alive. Mei is unconscious beside him. So far, he has a good understanding of who rules the island, their capabilities and possible plans to defeat them. Just then, Gantetsusai and Fuchi arrive and see him. Gabimaru wonders if they'll become allies or enemies in this quest. We continue where we left off with a standoff between our protagonists and the legendary sword dragon and his Asaman. Gabimaru is in an injured state and assesses the newcomers, Gantetsusai and his Asaman Fuchi. Gabimaru notices that they don't show any indication of having been through any serious fights. However, he does sense that Gantetsusai's left arm is abnormal and his instincts are correct. As soon as they arrived on the island, Gantetsusai was stung by a bug with a human face, forcing him to immediately cut his own hand, which was the right call, as flowers began to bloom from it. But even with this, Gabimaru knows that he can't win against them, not when he is still recovering from his previous fight. On the other hand, Fuchi wants to make this meeting as less bloody as possible. He is bound by his duty as an assayman. Therefore, he only sees Gabimaru as another criminal to be beheaded. He says he wants all the information he needs before carrying out his duty. Gabimaru takes this chance to strike a deal. He asks for their help in finding the elixir in exchange for vital information. Naturally, Gantetsusai and Fuchi are suspicious about it. But when Gabimaru relays to them about the Tensen and how they can easily regenerate their body parts, the two get excited. Gantetsusai has always wanted to defeat stronger enemies. He wants to be considered a legendary icon in history books. Fuchi, on the other hand, is more concerned about the body parts he can dissect once he acquires the dead body of the Tensen. With this, the three of them make a pact to storm into Harai, get the elixir and defeat the Tensen. Now that that's been settled, Gabimaru turns to Mei to check on her. But to his surprise, she's not a little girl anymore. It seems like she's bloomed into her teenage years in just one night and can now speak. Gabimaru is so overcome by this that he demands answers from her. However, in light of his growth, he calms himself down. Remembering what she did, he properly thanks her for saving him last night. Meanwhile, Sagiri and her group continue along the path that's filled with Hoko's former fellow villagers. As they walk, Senta finally understands something. According to Hoko, 
the place of Horai is where their souls are judged by the Tensen. Along with other religious terms and objects they have found, Senta can be certain when he says that this island and everything on it is man-made. Yuzuriha dismisses this, saying it doesn't really matter if everything is all mixed up. But that's exactly the point, Senta says, and it all matters. All the religious names and items and all the monsters they have encountered have shown evidence of mix and match. It's like someone collated all possible holy figures from different religions, put them together, and proposed them as part of a powerful new religion. Senta makes the connection because Moro Machia the Apostolate has created a fake religion to overthrow the Shogunate, and his schemes show similarities with the ones found on this island. If this theory is true, then they can assume a couple of things. First, this island is not natural as the legend says, but man-made. Next, the creator of the island made a religion surrounding immortality and the elixir to lure people in. It's not that no one can escape the island. Rather, humans are sent back as flowers to fuel the legends and entice more people to come. In a way, any human who comes to this island can achieve immortality, but they become flowers that are turned into tarn to feed the Tensen. This is a profound realization, but Yuzuriha manages to make it simple. If this theory is true, then they have bigger problems. How can they defeat this process that has existed for a thousand years? They don't have Gabimaru or Mei, which greatly lessens their number, but Sagiri expresses her faith that her ward is still alive. After all, going back to his wife is a strong reason for him to avoid death. Indeed, as she's speaking, Gabimaru is alive and well and interrogates Mei and how they can defeat the Tensen. Mei is still not used to speaking, so she says her thoughts in single words, Tao, Stong, weak, mind, body. She repeats all this, which is a puzzle to Gabimaru and others. She also says the words tandem and turn. Gantetsusai thinks she must be referring to a body part just below the navel in martial arts. But it doesn't answer Gabimaru's question, what is Tao? In fact, it's not only them that discuss Tao. Sagiri and her group discuss Tao as well, along with our other group, Shion and Nurigai, although they all have different interpretations of it. Tao is the power that flows through all things. In Xion's words, it is a wave of energy that envelops all people. Tao is different for each person. That's why he can sense their physical attributes despite his lack of sight. Developing it can take a long time, but once it's mastered, it grants strength and abilities beyond human capacity. Hoko believes that the Tensen have mastered Tao and are using it deliberately and leisurely. The best way to explain Tao is flowing through opposites, yin and yang, rage and calm. Once a person finds a middle ground between the opposites, or can take both opposites at the same time, then that person is said to have achieved Tao. As if to demonstrate this, Xion immediately assumes his fighting stance. He has sensed the Soshins behind them, ready to attack. As he cuts their limbs, he instructs Nurugai to follow his lead. He doesn't want to take another student under his tutelage not after Tenza's death. But Nurugai pleads with him because they both know they want to avenge Tenza's death, and she doesn't want to be a burden when that happens. Gabimaru, Gantetsusai and Fuchi also encounter Soshins. They defend themselves, with Gantetsusai carrying Mei on his shoulders to protect her. But Gabimaru senses another entity among them, not as powerful as a Tenzin, but with a similar energy signature at another place on the island, in a deep pit full of flowers. The siblings Chobei and Toma climb up and out. Despite the numerous hands and feet preventing them from climbing, they manage to escape. Chobei decides to go after the humans that have thrown them into the pit. He has analyzed that their weak spot must be around the navel area. He noticed this because when the man regenerated, the body parts came from the lower part of the body much like how a root blooms a new leaf above the soil. Toma tries to argue, but he knows that there are no changing plans once his brother has set his mind. Just then, another creature appears. He introduces himself as a Doshin who directly serves the Tensin. He is ordered to check on the humans to make sure they are dead. Chobei understands that the shortest way to get back at the Tensin is through this guy with tentacles for a face. He attacks the Doshin but he gets cut fatally around the throat. Toma runs to his brother, but he gets surrounded by Soshins. To his relief, Chobei gets back up as if nothing happened. But to the Doshin's horror, the human has regenerated the wound. Does this mean he's inhuman after all? The Doshin gets more confused when he sees that Chobei's Tao is getting bigger. 
Chobei still can't see the Doshin's Tao, but he can sense it. When he is asked about becoming inhuman because of his newfound powers, Chobei simply shrugs it off. He remembers their time with the bandits and how they have to change to simply survive. He understands that the only permanent thing in this world is change, and the ones who can't cope with it are the weak ones. Chobei attacks the Doshin. The latter tries to employ invisible attacks, but Chobei accepts all of them with rage. Then he spears through the Doshin's navel. Immediately he knows that his theory about the Tensen's weakness is right. Suddenly, his eyes turn black, and he can see the Tao enveloping the Doshin as the latter attacks him. Chobei wastes no time. He imitates how the Doshin gathers Tao into his hands and punches a hole into the enemy's stomach. The Doshin is alive, but barely. Toma is relieved that his brother is also alive. But he worries about the vine-like markings that have appeared on Chobei's skin. He worries that his brother may have transcended the line between humanity and something else. Back to Gabimaru and others, they keep fighting the Soshins coming their way. Gantetsusai keeps asking Mei if he has somehow mastered Tao. But the girl keeps saying, strong, strong, no. She also says this about Gabimaru and his fighting style. The Doshin who has been watching them spots Mei. Immediately he captures the girl and lands her gently on the ground. Then, to everyone's surprise, he calls the girl Mei Sama and asks her to come back to Horai. Gabimaru and the others are baffled. The Doshin explains that Mei originated from Horai but has been banished for centuries. They were instructed by someone named Rian Sama not to look for her. But now that they've found her, she must return immediately with them. Mei has the same origin as the Tensen, making her inhuman. Gabimaru initially doesn't plan on saving the girl, but he realizes that he hasn't been the same since he arrived on the island. Saving the girl is not an option that his old self would consider, but times change. Gabimaru puts himself between the girl and the Doshin. He assures Mei that he'll keep her safe. In response to this, the Doshin calls for another comrade. Then they summon centipedes and bugs to fight Gabimaru and Gantetsusai. Since the two convicts are not exactly in sync with each other, their teamwork fails in comparison to the two Doshins. Gantetsusai gets annoyed with Gabimaru, but he doesn't care. One of the Doshins asks him why they are sticking with Mei when she's not even a human. Gabimaru says he's only returning the favour because she saved him from one of the Tensen. Then he asks them why they want the girl back when it's obvious she doesn't like them. The Doshin says they need her for their training, then he proceeds to explain. Doshins are training their Tao under the guidance of Tensens. There are five steps in mastering it. Doin, Taisoku, Shuitsu, Shuten and Bochujutsu. The first four are preparations for the fifth step, which is the most important of all. It requires a partner to circulate the yin and the yang. In simpler terms, they are referring to sexual intercourse. The Tensen have the ability to circulate yin and yang in their body, allowing them to change sex. But for the others, they only possess either the yin or the yang element. The Doshins have the yang element, while Mei has the yin, which happens to be of high quality as well. Once Mei joins and trains with them, they circulate their yin and yang. Gabimaru and Gantetsusai don't need them to finish their explanation. Even as viewers, we don't need them to explicitly say what they had in mind once they get Mei. As Gantetsusai says, it makes one want to puke. The Doshin adds that even if Mei has the same origins as the Tensen, she is considered inferior. That's why Rian banished her in the first place. This person gave Mei the scar on her shoulder as a mark of her inferiority and lack of value. Gabimaru is simply furious upon hearing this. He's reminded so much of his wife, who experienced the same treatment from her father. And that seals his actions. He won't let Mei go back to the Doshins. But until he figures out how to use his Tao, he will never defeat the Doshins, not without any help from others. The enemies have transformed into their pseudo-Kishikai form. It's similar to the one Gabimaru has seen while fighting the Tensen. But instead of flowers, they use centipedes and bugs. Fuchi eventually steps in and explains how Gabimaru can harness his Tao. With the help of Mei, he slowly understands the concept. Strength, fruit of the weak. Weak, seed of the strength. If he can put his mind in between these opposing concepts, then he may have the chance to defeat the Doshins. Then it clicks. Gabimaru manages to explode the centipede arm because he can sense its Tao, and he uses his own to deflect them. In perfect unison, both Gabimaru and Gantetsusai defeat the enemies. Meanwhile, Sagiri's group finally reached the Red Gate of Horai. It opens as if welcoming them. 
Waiting for them is a red-haired Tenson, who smiles at them. We continue our story following Sagiri and her group as they travel through this hellish island. So far, Sagiri, Senta, Yuzuria and Hoko have not encountered any formidable enemies, unlike the other survivors on the island. But soon they reach the gates of Horai and they get welcomed in. Waiting for them is a stranger with red hair and a smile ready for them. His name is Mudan, and he's one of the Tenson Hoko talked about. As a welcome, he slices Hoko's head off, surprising the rest. But no one is more scared than Yuzuriha. She can feel the immense power emanating from this dangerous man. As a kunoichi, her instincts tell her that her best chance for survival is to run away. However, Mudan easily grabs her. He knows that among the humans, she's the only one who possesses a distinct amount of Tao. Perhaps if he performs bochu jutsu with her, then she can train her Tao more efficiently. Sagiri can also sense the stranger's power. But even if she's shaking with fear and uncertainty, she still tells him to let Yuzuriha go. Amused, Mudan calls his five Kyoshis. He lets two of them grab Yuzuriha, and then he sits on the third one who's in a prostrate position. There's no harm in having small talk with these insignificant humans. After all, it's not every day that he gets to talk with the humans he would consume later on. Mudan is forthcoming with information. He basically confirms Senta's theory about the island being man-made and luring humans in. Hoko's people were the first humans the Tenson experimented on. They only created a fake religion to keep some sort of rule on the island. And the elixir of life, it doesn't exist. However, they do need humans to create their tarn so they can maintain their youth and keep training their Tao. Knowing that there's nothing left on the island for them but their survival, Yuzuriha escapes from the Kyoshi and beheads Mudan. Then she urges Sagiri and Senta to run. Sagiri picks up Hoko's head. But Yuzuriha is underestimating her enemy. The three of them haven't even left the place when Mudan starts regenerating his body. He's still playful and relaxed, as if his body parts aren't held by various vines. He goes to Sagiri and pushes her away using distant strike. Mudan is serious about taking in the Kunoichi. Senta draws his sword and attempts to fight the Tenson. Unfortunately, his strength relies more on books and information rather than sword fighting. Yuzuriha has no choice but to fight openly. Before, she makes sure that no one can observe how she fights and the techniques she uses. It's part of her training as a shinobi. But they're trapped on this island and they're facing down a potential god or a monster. Survival must come first above all else. She consumes poison from one of her bamboo vials. Yuzuriha can control substances through her metabolism, allowing her body to process the poison and secrete it as a clear slime, which she can manipulate at will. She ties the Tenson using her slime, then cuts him into infinite pieces. And yet it doesn't do any significant damage to Mudan. He simply regenerates. He's even impressed that the Kunoichi can manipulate her Tao, although she may have not known it. Senta attacks him, but Mu Dan simply throws him away. Sagiri recovers, although her mouth is bleeding. She asks Hoko for any help or hints on how to defeat the Tensen. Thinking about Mei, he eventually reveals that the only way to finish a Tensen is to cut their tendon, located in their lower abdomen. He also reveals that one must use Tao to properly injure a Tensen. Using this information, Sagiri doesn't waste much time and lunges toward Mudan. She throws her sword toward his abdomen to serve as a distraction. She gets close to him, grabs her sword and makes an upward slash. Mudan avoids it, but he sustains an injury on his face that doesn't regenerate. Yuzuriha and Senta see this and are amazed by Sagiri. Mudan shifts his attention to the Asimon. He admits that he didn't see her Tao before. But now he understands that she must have the skills to make her Tao bigger at will. Well then, time to get more serious, Mudan says. He fights Sagiri, Yuzuriha and Senta at the same time. The three are working flawlessly with Yuzuriha and Senta, aiming to trap the Tenson so that Sagiri can end him. They manage to cut all his limbs. But then he floats up in the air. Mudan regenerates her body and changes into a woman. It seems like the Tenson can fly after manipulating the Tao around them. She creates bubbles around her and aims at them like bullets. Sagiri and Yuzuriha manage to run and hide. Sagiri realises she's getting easily tired after using the new breathing technique. She doesn't know yet that she's using her Tao, but she understands that it's taking too much of her energy. Yuzuriha says they shouldn't give up now. The Tensen is obviously avoiding Sagiri's attacks. So if they manage to trap the Tensen, Sagiri must not waste that chance to cut her. 
The Kunoichi runs and lassos Mudan using her slime, all while taking in the bubble bullets aimed at her. Then she pulls her down. Mudan returns to being a man, but before he knows it, Senta grabs him from behind and pierces him with his sword. Without ado, Sagiri uses all her energy to cut Mudan in half. This time, the Tensen doesn't move, and there's no sign of regeneration. The three of them decide to take a break after this intense fight. Sagiri picks up Hoko's head. The tree says he doesn't feel like dying soon, but he's more concerned about Mei's welfare. While resting, Sagiri asks Senta about his feelings for Yuzuriha. It's obvious that he has great admiration for her. Senta blushes and clarifies that it's more like being impressed with her sense of freedom. Senta has always wanted to be an artist. But growing up in the Yamada clan, every boy is expected to be an executioner. He tried his best to train, and fortunately, he rose to the fifth rank among the Asimans. But in his heart, he knows that happiness lies within ink and paper. Sagiri appreciates this honesty from him. Yuzuriha interrupts their discussion to point out a bush of blooming flowers growing right where they killed the Tensen. None of them knows what it is. But before they can do anything, a vine shoots out and aims for Yuzuriha. She would have been hit if Senta didn't push her. He got hit instead. Inside Senta's mind, he sees Yuzuriha kicking away the heads he'd cut from the criminals. She's prancing freely with an umbrella to match her carefree attitude. It's like she's kicking away all the responsibilities that he never liked to do. He sits a few feet away from her, content to draw her from afar. This seems real for Senta, but in truth he's only seeing hallucinations brought upon by the flowers that have bloomed from his body. His companions are in no better state either, because rising from the flower bush is a monster they've never seen before. A giant flower blossoms. Instead of having one, it has two styles, each one gender of Mudan, connected to one head by their necks. Sagiri is losing hope. Even Yuzuriha is valiantly trying to be brave. Multiple veins shoot out to strike them. In the nick of time, someone cuts them before they hit the two girls. Shion has arrived along with Nurugai. The girls immediately pull the flowering center out of the battlefield, leaving Shion to deal with Mudan's Kishikai form. Nurugai cuts the flowers from center's body. They all know it's too late for him. The least they can do is ease his suffering as he slowly transcends to the next life. Meanwhile, Shion studies his enemy. There's no doubt the monster has the same waves as the one who finished Tenza. He's still mourning the loss of his student, who has become like a brother to him. If finishing this monster can alleviate his feelings of revenge, then he'll go all the way to destroy it. He kicks the monster away, but not without repercussions. Even through scratches and cuts, Mudan can plant deadly flowers. And that's what he does to Shion. With no choice, he cuts the flowers, making him heavily bleed. Sagiri sees this and wants to help her senior, but she has depleted most of her energy, as well as Yuzuriha. Nurugai jumps onto the Kunoichi's back and hugs her. Nothing seemingly happens. When the kid hugs Sagiri, that's when the latter feels some form of energy transfer. Nurugai explains that Shion had found out she has this ability to transfer energy waves, or Tao, to other people. But Nurugai herself is not familiar with it, so she must be careful. Yuzuriha doesn't want to join the battle, so as a compromise, she covers the other girls with her slime as protection from the deadly flowers. With that, Sagiri and Nurugai run back to help Shion. Sagiri informs Shion about the tandon that should be cut to defeat the Tensen. He takes this advice. What follows is a fierce three versus one battle. Sagiri and Nurugai cut as many vines as possible, while Shion will attack it from behind. Through their sheer determination and battle prowess, the three of them overpower Mudan. All vines are cut cleanly, and they take time to regenerate. Shion is even proud of his junior and her impressive progress over the short amount of time they've been on the island. But they must not underestimate their enemy. Mudan is a Tenson that's lived for a thousand years. It will take more than a miracle to bring him down, adding to their enemy's formidable strength as obstacles are their wounds. Shion keeps on losing blood. Sagiri's and Nurugai's energy are almost depleted. They must destroy the monster as quickly as possible, or else it will consume all of them. Shion cuts its feet while Sagiri and Nurugai pin down its hands. Then Shion climbs onto the monster's petals and prepares to give the final blow. But he hesitates. If its weakness is really at the tandon, then he can't sense the energy flowing from there. The real weakness must be hiding somewhere. Vines are almost regenerated completely. Shion can't waste any more time. Just then, Senta comes in clutch to say that the weakest part is the ovule. It's the one part that provides the nutrients in any plant. 
Shion takes this in as he deflects the vines. Soon this monster will know how fleeting and heavy life can be. He cuts the ovule. Mudan can see that Shion has mastered the balance between life and death, the perfect yin and yang. In a way, he's grateful for this death. After 1,000 years of living, this must be like a rest to him. His blood spurts everywhere, which immediately turns to petals. The place instantly becomes a flower field as the Tensen leaves the living world. After the battle, they finally lay center to rest. Shion, Sagiri, who's carrying Hoko's head, Yuzuriha and Nurugai proceed further to find some shelter inside. They find an empty house that looks like a castle. They decide to spend the night there to recuperate from their injuries. There, they update themselves and discuss what has happened so far. Sagiri still thinks the elixir exists because Gabimaru strongly believes in it as well. After all, his village leader had shown it before. But Yuzuriha challenges this thought. It's a common practice for shinobi leaders to imprint their supernatural image on young shinobis, so it would be easier to train them. In addition, it doesn't make sense that Gabimaru will be allowed to have a wife at such a young age. It's possible that he must be under a form of deception, and that the concept of having a wife would be enough for him to follow suicidal orders. Village leaders must have a hold on their shinobis, more than instilling fear in them, so they can have overall control over them. Sagiri can't believe this possibility, but she must be realistic. She must find out the truth as soon as possible. But for now, she will hold on to the belief that Gabimaru will eventually return to his wife. Speaking of Gabimaru, he has lost his memories after the fight with the Doshins. He's with Gantetsusai, Fuchi and Mei, but he doesn't recognize them. It could be that the overexertion of his Tao may have caused him to forget everything. But even with this, he feels like there's something he must return to, or someone. As he looks at the full moon, he decides to find the answers to the questions that fill him. Thank you so much for watching. This completes our story covering the first season of Hell's Paradise, so please, if you'd love more recaps in the meantime, stay tuned to the channel. See you in the next video.